for the session today. My name is Jeremy. I'm going to be your host. I'll tell you what that means. It's pretty excited. I get to say hello to you. Uh, I'm going to welcome our speaker today, and then I'm going to wrap up the end with some Q&A. This year, we are submitting Q&A questions through the app, which you've probably heard a few times at this point. But just because it's one of the only things I'm going to do as a host, I'll tell you how to do it. Just go into the app, go into the QA part in the menu on the left, find the session, and you can submit the question right there. For those of you that are streaming online, you can uh, submit a question right within the interface that you're viewing. Uh, if you have an issue with that QA that uh, during the session here, I'm just going to be sitting on the side. You can come and I can note your question. Um, or if we have time, we can um, get a few questions from the room. So uh, welcome to today's session, which is securing Apple devices in education, peeling back layers uh, with Jamf's own Aunt Darla. So come on up and we'll get started. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. The after lunch session is the one that we need to start getting some more energy in, right? Like, yeah, yes, I liked it, yes. Um, so my name's Anthony, or Ant. Um, I'm a consulting engineer here at Jamf, and I focus on our education products and work with our education customers. So let's get off and start um, to have a look at the security landscape in education. Um, because it's education, not enterprise, right? So security is actually not that important. Or, or is it? I mean, that's still the sentiment that's thrown around a lot of education institutions, but we know in this room that that's no longer the case, right? Enterprise isn't the only kind of institution that gets, or, or you know, type of people that get attacked. In fact, last year, and I found this fact astonishing, last year, uh, universities were the most, uh, third most attacked institution after healthcare and finance. Okay, that was an astonishing fact that I thought. Now, of course, with more services going towards the cloud as well, uh, schools are spending more time online, and that just, in its very nature, makes schools and colleges, universities more susceptible to online threats. Um, and the tools really need to be specific and right for teachers, for students, for learning. Right? They need to not get in the way. Um, and these attacks are becoming more and more sophisticated. And they're becoming harder for people to spot that it's perhaps a phishing link or there's something on the device doing something nasty. And I find that harder. And I'm a so-called IT professional. And in some cases, we're asking children to do this for us. So we do really need to have a think about how we can help secure these devices in education in such a way, like I said, that doesn't get in the way of the teaching and learning, but that we know that these devices aren't compromised. So it is after lunch. So we do need to get the energy up. And don't get me wrong, security is important, but it can be a little bit dry sometimes. So let's start by uh, looking at an analogy to try and make things a little bit more fun about how we can layer up security and how we kind of do this in a day-to-day -day, uh, situation. And then we'll look at how we use the Jamf products to actually do the same thing when we're uh, securing our devices as well. So first things first, let's pretend that we've just bought a new house. We've moved all of our things in, our delivery driver's bin, and dropped off all of the boxes. And we've chosen what room we're going to use as our dining room, living room, if we're lucky, a little Jane up Lego man room as well. Um, and you know we're kind of settled in. We've been there for a little while, and night soon comes upon us. And I want to feel secure in my new home. So one of the things that I might do, first of all, is lock the door, right? I have a door and window, or doors and windows, that come with the house, that's fine. We need to shut them, that's the first thing that we do. And the second thing that we need to do is lock them, because then I start to feel really secure, right? Everybody would do the same if they went to bed, I'm sure. Lock the doors, feel a bit more secure. So that's like the first thing that we do when we get our new house, to make, make us feel like we're happy, that we can be safe inside of our house. Well, that's only the first thing that we do, right? We kind of make use of the things that were already built into the house. After that, we may decide that we're going to add a security system, a camera system, something that can show us things that we perhaps didn't know that was going on, whether that's inside or outside of our house. And possibly, we might add an alarm system as well. Again, alerting us to these things that we didn't know were happening, or that we can go back and review things if we think something suspicious has happened, right? I can go on my little app and rewind the video and see that, oh, no, it was just a cat that set off the alarm, or, or that kind of thing, right? So that's kind of what we do as our 
second layer to secure a house, right? Now, we have just moved in. So I don't know about you, but I have moved into a new home this year. And one of the first things that happens is you notice all of the things that happen in front of your house, the comings and goings of people, the regular cars that are going past. You have people stopping in going, hey, there's a new person there. I wonder what that, where they got that lampshade from. It looks pr really nice. You know, you, you'd notice these kind of things. Sometimes, though, they might be having a look in your house to be, hey, how can I get into this house, right? Without any kind of boundary to stop people from just walking up to my house and having a look into my window, it becomes a little bit difficult to, to stop people and that, that kind of thing. So we do something with our properties in order to help with that boundary too, right? We had a fence, gate, bush, wall, you know, any of those kind of things. And that there is our sort of third layer. So, you know, this is kind of what we do to our homes. It's these kind of layers of security. And we can do the same kind of thing when it comes to securing our Apple devices as well. So, right out of the box, um, Apple devices, of course, come with a number of security features. Okay? Things like the ability to be able to put in uh, passwords or passcodes to turn on file vault, uh, the firewall, for example. But they're built in, but they're not always turned on. Imagine going to your new house and not being given the key to lock the door. Right? And even if you are given the key, the onus is on the user to actually lock the door. And the same can be said with unmanaged devices. Often users don't even know that these features exist. They don't turn them on. Okay? And this has obviously a negative effect. It's like not locking the doors, for example. So we know that if we want to feel safe, we have to lock the doors. We know if we want to secure our data, we need to secure our devices. Potentially, even worse, if this is an unmanaged device, but you know, maybe you've set this up for the user as IT or something like that, given the right circumstances, they could even turn off something like File Vault, even if you've turned it off on. That's kind of like, you know, I've locked the door and gone to bed, but somebody else in the house has unlocked it before they've gone to bed. You know, we think we've secured something, but actually somebody else has done something different uh, to, to go back on what we've done. So great that all these things are built into macOS as standard, all these security features, but we need like locking the door to ensure that we enforce these. And this is where Jump School comes in. Obviously, Jump School is our education first, Apple best solution. Um, and it's a way that we can keep our users and devices safe. Now, let's face it, we can enforce all kinds of things when it comes to MDM, all kinds of configurations, all kinds of settings. And this isn't anything new for many of us. We've been doing this for years. But we've always spoken about it as management or managing the devices. But if we actually think about what we're doing, we've always been securing devices just under the guise of management. So, you know, things that we would often do are the things like we've already mentioned, but like enforcing the firewall, file vault, making sure there's a password on the device. Um, you know, even down to the fact that we uh, want to make sure that the users can't just install any application that they want. You know, we want to install them for them, we want to manage that kind of thing. If we think about it, what we're really doing there is securing the device. And that's why management is the founda foundational level to securing our devices. Um, so, you know, let's just take an example. Here you can see a payload for a firewall, uh, file vault. Um, uh, settings that we can enforce various different things to ensure that every single user has their file vault uh, um, encryption turned on. Um, once we've deployed that, of course, we can make sure that file, file, wow, file vault is turned on. Um, as soon as the user restarts the machine or logs out, they get prompted to do so. Um, they can't skip that kind of thing. Of course, they get given that big uh, unlock code. And as users do, they don't read what it says. They just click through it. So there's that big code that says, hey, if you get locked out, make sure you have that Bing log code. Because if you don't, you're not getting into your machine. They don't read that. They just click OK. OK. They forget about those things. We, we know what our users are like, right? Um, but if we have a look here and have a look at, again into the, um, the settings for firewall, Fire Vault, you'll see that we can't now deselect that. We can't turn that off. We've enforced that with Jump School. Now, just in case you were wondering, and I did make a big deal about it on purpose, that big long key, 
as part of the settings that we set here within our file vault settings, we've been able to uh, make sure that that's been copied into Jam School. So we can also help our users unlock their machines should they forget the password word and should they have not taken note of that big, long code. So Apple offers many security features straight out of the OS. Um, but not everyone's familiar with them, not v uh, familiar with the fact that they're available. And that's, like I say, where Jam for School comes in. We can make sure that we can enforce many different settings. Okay, we've only spoken about File, file Vault as an example today because it's just nice and easy to kind of show. But the point is, we've got all these things. We should start securing our devices using the built-in features and using something like Jam School to enforce these features to make sure that the doors are locked. Um, features like uh, rapid security response, um, password management there, what happens if the device gets lost and how we want to remote wipe them. There's a whole load of things, but it's that extra layer that we can have there to secure these devices to make sure these things are enforced. Now, I guess you would think that um, just from doing all those kind of things, that's a pretty good thing that we can do already, right? We're already in a fairly good state because we've been able to enforce these things. The device is now more secure than it was before. Uh, and it is. But what happens if we want to go further? Now, there is a second layer, like in our analogy. You know, our cameras are our alarms. Um, and actually, much like this first layer, Apple has um, uh, many things, or a couple of things, sorry, built into the, uh, into the OS already. But we can make things better. And that's where Jamf Protect comes in. Jump Protect does come in. It's also well, had lunch and is a little bit slow and sluggish too, clearly. Um, so Jump Protect is uh, Jump's endpoint security uh, and uh, anti-malware protection against Mac. Now, like I say, there are some things that are already built in to Mac OS around sort of security and threats. Um, and if you just use a Mac, then you make use of these almost you know, free of charge anyway. Now, these things that are built in are Gatekeeper and XProtect. And to just quickly go over what these are, Gatekeeper is that annoying little box that comes up when you try and uh, uh, open up an app or a package that isn't signed. And it's basically there just to say, hey, we're not sure if you trust this device. If you do, go ahead and trust it. Go ahead and say, yes, that's fine. That's not a problem and carry on. But you know, if you expected that this should be trusted and you, it's not, then you should probably not do anything with it. And then XProtect is um, an anti-malware um, engine to stop people from being able to actually you know, run malware on the device. The thing is, with both of these as admins, we can't have an insight to that this has happened on that user's device. Okay, we won't ever know that XProtect has kicked in on 10 of our devices or however many it is. We don't know that the user has skipped that gatekeeper um, little dialogue window that comes up. And that's where we can add to that second layer of protection that comes with macOS already with Jamf Protect. Like I say, Jamf Protect is our uh, endpoint security solution. It's built to work on macOS, and it uses the frameworks that are available in macOS, which basically means okay, that it has a very little impact on the user experience. And that's really important for us, remember, in terms of we want these, uh, these kind of solutions not to get in the way of teaching and learning. Um, it seems, yeah, simply just keeps um, simply just keeps the user safe and the technology doesn't get in the way. Um, also, uh, the database that the Jamf Protect uses is kept up to date by our Jamf Threat Labs team uh, that looks specifically for Apple threats. So, what would this look like on a user's device should they uh, accidentally have a piece of malware on the machine? So, as the video is playing, I'll kind of go over what's happening. The user's clicked on the, the malware here, and that first little box that you saw was Gatekeeper. So that's that built-in protection that's on the devices. Um, but as you saw, the user was able to dismiss that box and say, hey, it's OK. You know, This is something that should be trusted. What then happened almost immediately was that Jump Protect kicked in, because it saw that it was a piece of malware and kept the user safe. It did some other things that I think is also really, really important. Not only did it stop the malware from running, but it quarantined that piece of malware so that the user can't access it again and try and install it again and again and again. 
uh, and moved it somewhere where they, couldn't, where they couldn't reach it. But as IT admins, if you wanted to go and collect it to analyze it, you absolutely could. And of course, it then notifies the user, hey, this is malware, you, you, you can't use it. So I think that's super important. And in the background, in the console, We've recorded that so that you can go and do that threat hunting if you need to. You can understand what that threat was about, where it started, what kind of uh, user started that threat, the binary, and all those kind of things. You know those things that I said that you wouldn't see ordinarily with the built-in stuff that comes with macOS? We now have the ability to do this. Like with cameras, like with our alarms, we have the ability to go back and have a look at these things. Now, that's all very well for known malware. Right? Malware that we know the signatures for, but what about uh, novel attacks? Malware that uh, is not known but has those suspicious behaviors uh, you know, and those suspicious things that it's doing. Big, a big thing for Jamf Protect is um, the ability to collect this data and analyze it and sift out those suspicious activities, alert us as admins so that we can take action based on those findings. Again, all of these analytics are built on, uh, based on uh, the Jamf Threat Labs team. So their, their experience there. And it's uh, mapped to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. But what does that all very mean? That was very marketing, wasn't it? That was me there going, like, this is the official line on this thing, right? Uh, what does that actually mean? Like I said at the beginning, these attacks are becoming uh, more and more sophisticated. Uh, people know that if I do this one bad thing, a lot of the kind of anti-malware systems are going to find us because they know this is the one bad thing. So instead, they start to chain things together and some of these things that they chain together, these behaviors, they're on their own, are, aren't suspicious. But if you start to chain them together, we can start to build up a picture of what's happened and see that they're trying to do something more than just you know, the thing that was OK to do. Um, and then you know, they get these alerts, uh, like you can see here. And again, you can start to threat hunt and understand what's going on with these machines and help with those investigations. Again, much like with the Jamf School, we've just used some really, really simple examples here. There's much more to Jamf Protect. Uh, things like the ability to uh, control what kind of uh, removable media, USB media, goes into there, and if it needs to be encrypted before you can use it, right the way through to sending some of this technology that we've just said, where we can have that insight to things we wouldn't normally, to another Seams solution completely as well. So that's two out of our three. Can anyone remember what the last layer was? It was our fence. Okay? It was that ability um, to go away and put that barrier between the device and uh, the device and the machine. So our second layer, of course, what we've just looked at being the camera system, or the ability to go back and have a look at things. We now need to be able to um, put that fence around our our solution. And to do that, we're going to do that with Safe Internet, who was much faster than Jamf Protector showing up, if we saw then. Um, so yeah, we're going to create a boundary with Safe Internet. There we go. Um, so when it comes to Safe Internet, there are two sides of the story, like the, the two sides of the same coin almost. Um, they focus on slightly different things. But the first one is keeping students and teachers from uh, accessing inappropriate content. And we do this with our uh, content filtering that's powered by DNS over HTTPS and now on-device content filtering technology as well. And it's the part of Safe Internet that most people will know. It's the ability to ensure that students and teachers can't access those appropriate uh, websites, for example, based on categories. Now, as you can see, We've got an extensive list of categories, and each one of these has a sub list of categories as well, so you can really go there and make your, uh, your policies as you need them. And of course, you can add custom domains should you need to for your needs in your school as well, and your specific needs. But further to this, we can also enforce Google Safe Search and uh, YouTube Restricted Mode, which in, again ensures that um, the people only have access to the appropriate content. So for example, this will help prevent inappropriate images turning up in a Google search, for example. Um, and as a, a quick example, let's have a look what that would look like on this student's device. Students will be students, and kids will be kids. So the first thing they do, of course, is not go to the website you've asked them to. They want to go and play games. OK? Um, so the first thing I want to point out, though, is safe search. As I said, we can enforce safe search on these devices. 
if we went to go and have a look in Safe Search, or as a student, I tried to turn it off, you'll see I can go to the Safe, safe Search option, and um, those with eagle eyes, because it's a bit blurry up, up in here, um, we'll see that it says it's managed by your admin, uh, you can't change this. So even as a child, I wanted to try and turn Safe Search off. It is enforced, in this case, by Safe Internet. Now, going back to the, the actual uh, search itself, um, like I say, this kid wants to do play games. As soon as they try and click on games, it gets blocked because that's a category we've blocked within the Safe Internet um, console there. We know that that student is focused on their task now. Now, that's the first side of the coin. The second, kind, uh, the second side of the coin is something that is less talked about, I think, sometimes when we, when we think about Safe Internet, but it's that protection against web-based threats. So here we're talking about things like um, web-based malware traffic, uh, phishing, spam, those kind of things that, you know, on the face of it to a student, to a user, look harmless, but are going to do something nasty in the background. Again, let's take an example of what this might look like in a school situation. So this uh, child here is opening up their email client to do some homework. They've got a few emails, but one of those is from IT. It says it's urgent, and if we were to read the email, it says that there's been a password breach and they must reset their password. There's a link there as well to a Office 365 uh, looking kind of website to click through to go reset our password. Now, if we were to look at this properly, you might spot a few things because we're looking at it. Like, this has come from an iCloud address. Is the school IT really using an iCloud address? The, they've spelt Microsoft a little bit strange. And at the very bottom there, you'll see that they're from the JAMF Academy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I always thought it was JAMF. Um, but that's very easy for us to do when we start to go and have a look at this email, right? Let's not forget, it says urgent. You know, it's, it's got that pressure, and we would probably just look at that in general and go, yeah, it looks kind of cool. It's a Microsoft address. We'll probably click on it. And in this case, the student is going to click on it. And what we'll find is when they do, it gets blocked, because it actually wasn't from IT, as we've already suggested. It was a phishing attempt. But they've not been able, the student's not been able to get to that uh, particular website, which means they haven't then given away their credentials, which could have potentially then meant that you know, a bad actor has then been able to get to other school services, confidential data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because we're not asking students to you know, look out for these kind of phishing li links. We should definitely advise them that they, we, they, they shouldn't have to spot them, but we've kind of got their back in the background as well, because like I say, these things are getting more and more sophisticated and harder to spot. And again, just like um, Jamf Protect, this, there's a log of this data within the Jamf Safe Internet Console as well. So again, you can go in there and have a look at what's happened, what domains were used, and try and build up that big picture of what's happened with that particular attack. So that's our third layer, Jamf Safe Internet. The device itself has a number of security features baked right into the OS, just like our house has windows and doors. But if we don't shut the doors, we don't lock the doors, they're not going to do much good. And then often to enhance the security of our house, we do things like add uh, cameras, alarms, which enable us to see things that we wouldn't normally see and review footage afterwards. And then finally, we put up those gates and those fences to keep people coming near our house by accident or maybe not by accident, but we're keeping that distance between the thing that matters to us and the public. And it's just the same with our Apple devices. Using MDM, we can ensure those built-in macOS features are enabled and working, um, much like shutting the door, locking the door. With Jump Protect, it's basically the alarm system that we could have. We wouldn't know somebody was trying to get into our garage unless we had those kind of systems. Um, you know, Jump Protect is our anti-malware uh, software, so it will stop known malware, but then give us that information that we need to be able to go away, see what's happened, threat hunt, and just kind of generally make sure that we're aware of these things that are happening on our devices. And then finally, jump safe internet. You know, it's like that fence, that wall. It stops things from coming close to our device in the first place, right? Stop bad things from getting close to our device. So today we focused on uh, Mac OS mainly. Um, but the same can be said for iOS as well. We can use those layers of security as well 
there. It's more than just the OS. We can layer these things on top of that. Of course, that now should say 17. You can see here that I've prepared these slides before Tuesday. Um, but really, I think the thing that I want people to take away here is that management is the foundation of securing your devices. Like, n let's not forget that. We've been securing our devices for a long time. We've just called it management. But that alone is no longer enough. We need to layer on the additional tools to make sure that we have these devices that we can call safe and secure. So thank you very much for listening. Um, have we got any questions? Uh, yes, we do have a question uh, that came in. And I think you showed it on the screen there as far as reporting within Safe Internet. But yep. the question is, uh, what are the reporting features for Safe Internet? And is there a report that can't be sent to parents? I think that was supposed to be can be sent to parents. Sure. So we can see uh, two kinds of reports. We can see the security port reports, as we saw on the screen there, that, uh, like I say, looks at those kind of the, the second side of the coin, those web-based threat uh, prevention type of things. We also have another kind of report that shows those content uh, that have been blocked, uh, the kind of categories and all those kind of things. Uh, as it stands today, um, they, are, they live within the console. Um, we don't have any uh, ability to send them, like say, directly to a parent or anything like that. Um, but I'm sure that if that's something that you need to provide for your parents, um, there would be ways for you to be able to, uh, to deliver that, but not through the product, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And a follow-up question uh, in that same category. From an admin standpoint, can you create reports on each layer of security? Uh, yes, but not under one single pane of glass. Um, there is three consoles that we have here to do, to do this. Um, that being said, um, you are able to pull out various bits of data through APIs, for example. So you could build yourself you know, your own dashboard to pull from these three different things. Um, so it, there's a little bit of work in there, but you definitely could create a custom tool for, the, for that to be a ca the case, for sure. Great, thank you. Those were the questions that came in. Um, I know you were going to also tell us when people have more questions, how to get, get in touch with you. Uh, yes, I absolutely had a slide for that. It doesn't appear to be here now, but uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, uh, Anthony Darlow. You can just find me there. I'm also hang out on the Mac admin Slack. Not as much as I should, but I am. I'm, you can find me there as well. Um, and if you have any additional questions that you want to ask about this particular topic, I have a brain date available uh, for people that are in person here at 3 p.m. today that still has some spaces left in it. So if you'd like to catch up over a brain date, then that would be fantastic as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ant. Let's hear a round of applause. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. I did want to just make another plug for uh, the, the party that's happening tonight. We'd love to see you there. That starts at 6.30. The buses start leaving at 6 from this location, the convention center, off of Trinity Street, which is right outside of the expo room. So thanks again for joining us today, and I hope you have a great afternoon.